Hi, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Srinivas Kunte. I'm the director for professional learning and advocacy at CFA Institute. Our topic for this week is on mid cap investing. Some think that mid cap investing is actually an oxymoron. Uh, yes, uh, mid cap stocks are slightly unloved compared to the richer, uh, healthier cousins in the large cap category. But since you are attending this webinar, you are probably not among the faint hearted and you are probably uh, among those who, who have seen an up down movement of 50% and more. There are lots of myths on uh, mid cap investing and you know today's webinar will hopefully uncover some of these myths. And we'll also look at some of the biggest principles that come to play in mid cap investing. And for doing this, we have got one of the best minds in this space in India, Harshad Patwardhan. Uh, Harshad is the chief investment officer at Edelweiss Asset Management. He's uh, a veteran, of course, 27 years, nearly three decades, both on the buy side and the sell side. Uh, Harshad graduated from IIT Bombay and he did his post-graduation at uh, I am Lucknow. Importantly, uh, Harshad is a CFA charter holder and he's been a uh, very generous and kind supporter of everything that CFA Society India and CFA Institute do. Uh, Harshad has a fascinating, fascinating profile, lots of uh, rich wisdom. He recently got an award uh, in, in, uh, in, in fund management. Uh, you'll know more about Harshad from his presentation and without further ado, Let's begin. Just before we begin, a few housekeeping instructions. The webinar is for one hour, 30 to 35 uh, minutes of talk from Harshad, followed by an interactive Q&A. Uh, uh, if you have questions, try to put them on the uh, uh, Q&A box. Uh, and don't keep your questions to the last minute. Keep them coming. So let's begin. Over to you, Harshad. Thank you very much for, uh, for presenting today. Thank you very much, uh, Srinivas, for the kind introduction. I hope I'm audible before I start. Yes, very clear. Thank you. Fantastic. So thanks a lot uh, uh, for everybody attending this seminar and taking uh, you know one hour uh, on Thursday evening. And thanks a lot uh, to CFA Institute uh, India also for giving me this opportunity. Uh, today, I'm going to share uh, you know some of my experiences managing a mid cap strategy for almost 14 odd years. So, you know, what, what learnings we had uh, in different aspects, uh, I would love to share them with you. Uh, we actually launched this strategy uh, when I was in JP Morgan way back in end 2007, beginning 2008, uh, we launched our fund. Uh, the name of the fund changed in 2016 when JP Morgan sold its India business to Edelweiss. So over 14 and a half years, uh, you know, we have been managing this strategy and there are very interesting uh, learnings from those, which I would like to share today with you. But before we begin, it's very important to define the subject. Uh, what is a mid cap? Uh, luckily now we know, we exactly know what a mid cap is in the Indian context. But when we started, uh, we actually asked a bunch of people as to what is your definition of mid cap and frankly, Till about a few years ago, even in India, different people had different ideas of what mid cap meant. So some people would say that anything below half a billion dollar market cap is a mid cap. Some people would say a billion dollar and less and so on. So there was no common definition for mid caps. What that resulted in, in the, in the mutual fund industry, that there were many funds which were in a way missold, that they were not really mid cap funds, but were sold like mid cap funds. Also, uh, many fund managers actually deviated from the mandate, both in letter and spirit, because there was no common definition uh, of mid caps. And it was a very, very confusing scenario for the uh, retail investors, because just by the name of a fund, you couldn't really say whether it, was, it is a genuine mid cap fund or not. A few years ago, uh, SEBI, which is a market regulator in India, actually decided to define what a large cap, mid cap and small cap means. Uh, so in a way, it is a good thing because the, now we exactly know what we are talking about and particularly the investors exactly know from the name of the fund, what exactly it is meant to do. So as per uh, Sevi's definition, 
the top 100 companies by market cap are called large cap now. So it's a floating definition as the market moves up and up, uh, goes up and down, the actual market caps will vary. The next 150 stocks, 101st to 250th, are called mid cap stocks. And everything below that are called small cap stocks. So if you look at it now, and this exercise actually is repeated twice a year. So based on Jan to June average, uh, in the beginning of July, you come out, uh, uh, you know, Amphi comes out with a list of which are the large caps, mid cap and small caps and so on. Uh, so that's repeated twice a year. If you look at the last iteration, which was carried out in July, uh, the borderline between large cap and mid cap is about $5.1 billion in market cap. And the borderline between mid cap and small cap, that's the 250 at 251st company, is about $1.6 billion. That is just to put it uh, in a context. So let's begin. Uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about today, basically trying to cover four different themes. Uh, first is, as Srinivas uh, you know, alluded to, there are many, many myths surrounding mid-cap investing, particularly in India. I don't know whether it is also the case in developed markets, but in India, there definitely are many myths. And uh, it's sad to say, but many myths which were there when we started this strategy about 14 years ago, many of those myths still persist despite our attempt to dispel many of these myths. So I will talk about three of the most important myths. Then we will go on to talk about uh, historical returns. The reason for, for saying that uh, is uh, in the Indian context at least, uh, there is a lot of discussion that happens about returns in the large cap space versus mid cap space. Uh, and that is a hot topic of discussion uh, whenever people in the industry meet. So I'm going to talk about historical returns, what do they tell us? The third thing uh, is why successful mid-cap stocks generate superior returns. So we will go uh, you know, in some detail as to where do they, what are the sources of return for successful mid-cap stocks? And of course, uh, how to avoid the impact of inevitable mistakes. You know, mistakes are inevitable when it comes to mid-cap investing. Uh, how do you reduce the impact of that on the portfolio return? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And lastly, we will touch upon liquidity, which I think is a very, very important part, again, ignored by most people in the market, uh, both on the manufacturing side as well as on the distribution side. But liquidity is very crucial uh, when it comes to mid-cap investing. Uh, before I, I get into the myths, uh, let me just say here that whatever I'm going to say about mid-caps is almost equally applicable also to the small cap universe. But uh, you know, I will not uh, say every time mid caps and small caps, but most of it is relevant to small caps as well. So let's look at what are the three critical or important myths and enduring myths about mid caps. The first one is that mid caps equal to inferior quality. You know, unfortunately, this is a myth that has uh, perpetuated for a long, long time. Many people seem to believe that when you say mid cap, uh, it has to be inferior in terms of either management quality, in terms of balance sheet strength, uh, or in some respect compared to the corresponding large cap. Uh, and therefore, I have, I have rated this as myth number one, which has persisted for a long, long time. And many of the misconceptions about mid cap investing actually stem from this particular myth. As I mentioned before, the regulator has categorized uh, all the stocks now into large cap, mid cap, small cap categories based on market cap ranks and not based on any quality parameters. Anybody who has uh, been exposed to the market for some time is aware that there are lousy large cap stocks and there are very high quality mid caps and small cap stocks also. So please, uh, you know, my, my submission is that please do not equate mid caps or small caps with inferior quality. What we try to do in uh, the way we have managed uh, this strategy is that we try to focus on identifying businesses in smaller product market segments, right? So you are not diluting the quality of the business. You are just looking for good quality businesses in smaller segments. So they are either mid caps or small caps in terms of market cap. And I cannot really talk about stocks, but I can give you some sectoral examples. And people who are familiar with the Indian industry and Indian markets will immediately recognize what I'm talking about. So if you look at capital goods, as I said, it's a very vast space, 
lots of mid caps and small cap stocks there but if you look at one segment of capital goods uh, if you take bearings industry now uh, bearings in industry in india is dominated by three companies uh, with, and all of them are subsidiaries of large bearing multinational companies they have the best access to technology they have very good competent managements with track records and uh, they also have uh, uh, you know good products access to good products good balance sheet uh, they are still mid caps and small cap stocks not because they are not leading businesses in what they do but bearing industry in india is clearly very very small and don't forget that these definitions are all relative definitions so bearing industry is never going to be as big as a banking industry or a telecom industry so it's entirely possible that these these stocks will always remain small caps or mid caps but still deliver very very good returns similarly in specialty chemicals which has been talked about a lot over the last several years you will find that there are companies stocks in india companies which are leading companies in what they do in one or two products they are world beaters number 1 number 2 number 3 but they are small caps and mid caps they have delivered good returns you know and, and again they may just continue to be mid caps or small caps uh, because the size of the industries are small so uh, you know myth number 1 mid caps signify inferior quality it's simply not true the second myth uh, it actually again uh, emanates from the first myth that if you implicitly believe that mid caps are of inferior quality you would also believe that they should trade at a discount to the large caps now before we get into the table and i will you know briefly explain how to read this table uh, many people make a mistake of comparing mid cap valuations and and it is perpetuated i think in the media that people very loosely talk about mid cap valuations and large cap valuations by looking at the valuations of the corresponding indices now that's a grave mistake because if you look at the composition of large cap index versus mid cap index they are very very different just as an example if you look at bfsi as a sec sector its weightage in large cap index index is almost twice that of in mid cap index if you look at industrials as a sector you will notice that the weightage in mid cap index is almost twice that of the large cap index so there is no point in my opinion in comparing valuations at the index level because the composition is so different if you have to compare i think you should compare it within the sector you know as close companies as possible so what i have done here is i have given three examples i will just uh, explain one so in auto ancillary space uh, what you can see uh, on the chart is the price to earning ratio i am taking a very very simplistic we are not going into a very you know big uh, rigorous details of valuation simplistically i want to demonstrate how that myth is incorrect uh, so if you look the way to read it is on the in the first uh, column you have large cap auto ancillary business uh, its price to earning ratio on a one year forward basis over the last 5 years and how it has changed in the second one you have a corresponding uh, mid cap auto ancillary business and they are fairly comparable to each other uh, and the third column is premium or discount so as you will notice 5 uh, years ago the discount uh, was 35% so the mid cap auto ancillary stock traded at 35% discount to the large caps however because it continued to deliver strong earnings growth post good return ratios it actually outperformed uh, the large, the corresponding large cap stocks and today it trades at a very significant premium to the corresponding large cap stocks so uh, frankly there is no logic uh, to this myth as to why mid caps have to trade at a discount to large caps you know many people who who talk uh, very vociferously about it treat it as if it's some immutable law of physics that they have to trade uh, at a discount but here is a demonstration uh, in in by facts that that is simply not true the third myth uh, that again has perpetuated is that foreigners don't invest in mid caps uh you will see the pie chart this is at the end of june this is published every uh, quarter i don't have the september numbers but uh what you see here is the ownership pattern of nsc mid cap 100 index and that's the index that's the benchmark used by most of the mid cap strategies in india uh you will notice uh the green uh, pie green uh, part fpi holdings that's foreign portfolio institutions null holding is 15.6% 
and on the top you will see dii holdings that's domestic institutional investors that holding is 13.9% so the fact is that foreigners own or foreign institutional investors own more of mid cap index than actually domestic institutions so again this third myth that fpis and foreigners do not invest in mid caps is clearly not true now let's uh, see uh, let's look at historical returns from different perspectives and see what do they have to tell us there are different ways of course at looking at past returns what i have done on this particular table is that we have looked at uh, year wise returns why i am starting from 2001 is because mid cap index actually started from that year so we have 21 years of uh, data now as to how a large cap index has done and how the mid cap index has done in each of the calendar years uh, the green uh, ones on the on the third column uh, is where mid caps in mid cap index has outperformed large cap index and the red one is when mid cap index has underperformed large cap index a quick look uh, at this table tells you that 12 out of 20 years if you look at full year or if you include 2021 then 13 out of 21 years uh, mid cap index has outperformed large cap index so that's uh, you know one take away from this and you can also see uh, how you know uh, the pattern in outperformance versus underperformance i would like to note uh, note here that if you look at calendar year 2018 and 2019 uh, when mid cap index underperformed large cap index by 19% and 16% they were the worst years on record uh for mid cap performance versus large cap performance so that's something uh, that one must note if you look at it differently which is really long term how mid cap indices have done versus large cap indices you will notice that over long periods of time mid cap index has generated higher returns on a cagr basis if you look at 20 years since inception 21 or uh, 20 years plus you will notice that there is almost a 3 and a half uh 4% kind of cagr difference which is quite meaningful the third way to look at it which i think is more relevant for people who put money in in mutual fund schemes because these are typically open ended and 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 retail investors can come in at any time if you look at three year daily rolling return basis you will notice that almost two thirds of the time mid cap index has outperformed large cap index if you change that from 3 year rolling to 5 year daily rolling return basis 3/4 of the time mid cap index has outperformed large cap index and mind you this particular comparison that i'm talking about is at the index level uh, people who are familiar with indian markets uh, you know would know that many good quality mid cap funds have managed to generate significant alpha so actually if you do this comparison between best performing large cap fund versus best performing mid cap fund the gap will be even bigger and the last one and this is interesting uh this is just an observation you know uh, uh looking at the market so over long periods of time a uh, very interesting observation this is frankly true for large caps also but it is even more pronounced for mid caps that the returns from mid caps uh when the the upturn starts tend to be front ended i will just explain with the first example there are three examples we have given uh if you look at a period from april 2003 to jan 2008 uh you will notice that if you look at the first column the total holding period return in that uh, time frame uh, was 664% of which in the first year itself you got 142% return so on a cagr basis uh you know the cagr returns in mid cap index in that time frame were 53% but if you miss the first year uh the returns came down to 36% still good but not as good as 53% so that's another interesting point that that i want to leave you with as far as returns are concerned let's move to uh you know interesting things about selectivity sources of return and the inevitable mistakes that uh, one tends to make when it comes to mid cap now before we we get in there uh, it's interesting to see uh, it's not surprising but it's interesting uh, nevertheless to see that uh, mid cap stocks are less covered than large cap stocks so if you look at in the indian context uh, today uh, large cap stocks on an average that is top 100 stocks 31 analysts cover it and frankly uh, it 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 it's something which is which might be surprising to many 
uh, in the audience today that some of the uh, large cap stocks in India in sectors like uh, like petrochemicals, banking, tech, uh, you know, some of the biggest companies are, you know, number of analysts covering them is higher than the corresponding number of analysts covering their peers, even in developed countries like, like US. So I would say that as far as Indian market is concerned, it is over research when it comes to large cap. But when you go to mid caps and small caps, you will realize that number of analysts drops precipitously. So 18 on an average analyst covering mid caps. And when you go to small caps, that number really drops a lot. So if you have the skill and if you have the temperament and time to do your own research, there are ample opportunities in the small cap and mid cap space to find uh, you know, good quality companies before they are widely recognized by the market. And that's Sorry, just, just one, one question for, for just, uh, you know, uh, putting some debate here and also for, for people uh, to, to appreciate uh, things. You mentioned those myths, Harshad, right? Uh, so, so in that context, uh, why is the coverage for mid cap stocks lesser than uh, large cap? Okay. I, I think Srinivas. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So Srinivas, the answer to that is uh, uh, that is the way the uh, institutional brokerage uh, world works, right? They want to cover uh, what stocks that can give the commission from the clients. And in down markets, when nobody is asking about mid caps and small caps, they don't want to spend their, their resources tracking uh, you know, mid cap and small cap stocks because clients are just not interested at that point of time. And you can write bigger commissions covering large cap stocks. Great right? insight. Fantastic and insight. And that is an advantage for people like us who have a research experience on their own that you do not have to rely on sell side brokerages to start a coverage of a particular stock. You know, you know many of these stocks from the previous cycle. So you can really get an advantage uh, if you have been in the market for a long time uh, that it may not be covered by anybody. So for example, you know, one of the biggest success for in our funds, uh, a banking stock, when we actually bought it in our portfolio way back in 2007, 2008, um, uh, you know, pretty much nobody uh, on the street was covering that particular bank. So that is the advantage and that leads me to my next point as to why successful mid cap stocks uh, do not really deliver good returns. If I can go to the next slide. Okay, before that, uh, let me quickly run through why bottom up stock picking is absolutely important uh, uh, you know, for mid cap and small cap. Of course, the stock level dispersion is, is there even in large caps, but it's even more pronounced in mid caps and small caps. So what I've done here is on the left hand side, uh, if you look at, and this uh, we calculated as on 13th October, uh, if you look at mid cap index, year to date is up 55%, but look at the best performing stock in that index and the worst performing stock. The dispersion is just mind boggling. On the right hand side, uh, we have year to date numbers again for specific sectors. Now, the top sector is uh, the, the uh, NBFCs. In NBFCs also, you will notice that there is a very wide dispersion and on the, below you have cement stocks. Uh, you will notice that even within a sector, there is very, very wide dispersion. So the conclusion from that is that, yes, there are times when you can take a top-down view on a sector, but there is absolutely no substitute for bottom-up stock picking. That is the point that I wanted to highlight through this slide. Now, coming to uh, Srinivas, the question that you asked, uh, I wanted to explain that using this example. I will just take uh, you know one example, the, the chemical company. Again, I can't unfortunately disclose the names, but uh, I will explain how to read this table. So uh, on the top is uh, the three parameters that I have given for that chemical uh, uh, company. Uh, stock price, one year forward rolling EPS at that point of time, and price to earning ratio. So if you look at the way to read it is five years ago, this particular stock was available at 375 rupees a share. Uh, one year forward EPS at that point of time was 20 rupees and the price to earning ratio, it was trading at 18.7 times. If you look at today, and I've given three years, one year. So if you look at today, the prices are I've already given. So on over five years, this stock has delivered 46% compounded returns 
of which 23% has come from earnings progression. I'm very carefully using the word progression and not growth because when I say earnings progression, it has two components to it. One is the growth that happens with passage of time. You know, all businesses are trying to grow and also the earning upgrades and downgrades that analysts would do who are tracking that particular stock. So the, the analysis of the 46% compounded returns over five years for this particular stock are 23.4% has come from earnings progression and 17.4% has come from valuation re-rating. So the point uh, that uh, Shrinivas, I was you know, uh, trying to explain to you that if you have the inclination, have the time and the skill to identify the stocks early on, you can really benefit both from the earnings growth as well as from the re-rating that happens when that stock becomes more visible, when it becomes bigger, more people look at it and so on. Uh, by the way, uh, in that, that particular uh, table, uh, you should remember that the relationship between earnings growth and uh, valuation re-rating is multiplicative in nature. So if you just add, sum it up, it, you will not get uh, the return number. So, uh, and I'm also similarly given for the other companies. So the big message from this is really that a successful mid-cap idea, uh, you know, if you are early on, you benefit from both the sources of return, earnings growth as well as re-rating. For this table, uh, you know, in the Indian context, dividend, which is the third source of return, I've ignored because dividend yield in India, as all of you know, tends to be very small. So it will not make a big difference. So that's a big message that I want to give from this particular slide. Uh, this is a very, very important slide uh, because, uh, you know, I don't want to give an impression that mid cap, small cap investing is easy. Uh, it is not. Uh, uh, and you will tend to make lots of mistakes, you know, during 14, 14 and a half years of managing this strategy, even we have made lots and lots of mistakes and mistakes are inevitable uh, when it comes to mid cap and small cap investing, because as we saw, these are the kind of stocks which are not very well covered. So uh, you're, you're bound to make mistakes from time to time. Uh, it is important to understand how to minimize the impact of those mistakes on the overall portfolio return. So the first point there is that it's very important to size your bets properly. So you have to size your bet proportional to your level of conviction. It's very important not to get carried away by after meeting a particular company uh, and thinking how exciting it is. Uh, and go ahead and, and buy a very large quantity before you have really done your due diligence and develop conviction. So sizing the bets becomes very, very important. Unfortunately, in our industry, uh, at least in India, a lot of discussion that happens happens about stock discovery, how to identify a good stock. And not a lot of discussion happens on the other important aspect, which is how to size the bet. I think that's absolutely important. The other second point is that it's very important to have a appropriate level of diversification appropriate for that particular mandate so for example if you are if you, for example the, the you know the fund that i am managing is a, a mutual fund it's a pooled fund where retail investors can also invest 5000 rupees 10000 rupees uh, i believe that in that kind of a mandate appropriate level of diversification is very very important diversification because if you are going to make mistakes in you know which are inevitable it doesn't impact the portfolio returns uh, uh, significantly. So diversification uh, is an important risk mitigation uh, strategy, particularly for retail investors. There are different kinds of mandates where the kind of investors are different, where you can go for a focus strategy. The third one is very, it's very important to be mindful of negative bets. Now that is something that doesn't come very naturally uh, to most people. I don't think human uh, you know, brain is programmed to think about negative bets because we focus more on what we own in the portfolio. However, particularly for relative return mandates, this is very, very important because if you are going to be, let's say very, very, uh, you know, sort of big holdings you have, let's say in IT sector, much higher than the benchmark, it's inevitable that you are taking an inadvertent negative bet somewhere else, that it's possible that you are taking a big negative bets on, let's say BFSI sector. It's very important when you're thinking from a portfolio construction perspective that yes i mean we also construct our portfolio from a bottom up perspective but as a risk mitigation layer you have to think in terms of what are the inadvertent negative bets that i'm taking and am i uh, am i really that sure 
to take that kind of a negative bet in this particular sector. So being mindful of negative bets is, is the third point that is very, very important to remember. And the last one, again, very important is to be very ruthless uh, when your hypothesis proves incorrect. So when you are buying a particular stock for the portfolio, you obviously have a hypothesis as to why are you buying it? And what is your expectation in terms of earnings progression and valuation re rate? Uh, it's often that you know uh, your hypothesis goes wrong for various reasons that originally you made a mistake or the circumstances changed and your hypothesis is, is now in doubt. It's very, very important. Uh, and again, this is something that I would like to highlight uh, and emphasize that it's very important not to fall in love with the, with the business, the stock that you buy. Many people tend to uh, you know, uh, develop an affinity with the management of the, of the stock of the company that they buy. I think that is that can be very dangerous because it does not allow you to be ruthless when you have to be ruthless and your hypothesis has proved incorrect. So weeding out stocks early on when you, you recognize that you have made mistakes uh, early uh, actually helps you uh, generate good returns from a portfolio perspective over medium to long term. If you stay with your mistakes, when you have completely recognized that you have made a mistake, if you stay with that, that will actually result in suboptimal returns. So these four points, in my opinion, are very important uh, in order to uh, lessen the impact of inevitable mistakes from portfolio perspective and also for, from the perspective of portfolio construction and risk mitigation. Lastly, I will come to uh, a very important point, which as I mentioned before, that most uh, practitioners uh, tend to ignore and uh, uh, as well as distributors tend to ignore. Uh, losing sight of liquidity of underlying stocks while building position can really cause trouble. Uh, many times it does happen that you, you know, like a particular stock a lot and you buy it in, in, a quant in, in such quantity that you shouldn't be buying. Uh, many times I think people get carried away and build large position, which actually then become illiquid positions. And in stress time, that can actually uh, play havoc uh, with the portfolio returns. We have seen that uh, somewhat in 2018 uh, in the Indian context when the market is corrected. We have also seen that, although our discussion today is not about that, but many people will, will know what I'm talking about. It, we have also seen in 2019 and 2020 in the fixed income market that if you have illiquid uh, securities that can cause a lot of problem for the uh, investors. Particularly, uh, I would say investors who decide not to redeem. So pockets of illiquidity will actually compromise the interest of investors who do not redeem quickly. So it's very important from a, you know, from a, uh, from a fiduciary responsibility perspective is to balance the performance and liquidity for long-term interest of all investors. Because when I like a particular stock, I want to, when I'm, when I'm deciding as to how to size the bet, I have to not only think about expected returns, but whether the liquidity is appropriate. If redemptions come, will I be able to sell uh, my holdings proportionately in an orderly fashion? I think that's a very, very important component that I think professional uh, fund managers should keep in mind. And uh, you know, even otherwise, uh, when you are uh, investing in small caps and mid caps, do consciously think about liquidity from the perspective that if you have to sell it, will you be able to sell it in an orderly fashion. What we do uh, in our strategy is that we factor in liquidity at the design stage itself. So when I'm thinking about the bet to take, I not only think about sources of return and expected returns, but also think about how much uh, you know, uh, uh, illiquidity uh, that we should build in the portfolio. So it does not come as an afterthought. It comes at the design stage itself. Uh, so this was my last slide. Uh, so you know these were some of the learnings from managing this particular strategy and observing the markets in general for the last uh, 15 years on the buy side and about 25 plus years on the sell side. Uh, Srinivas, I think I will take a pause and we'll be happy to answer any questions. No, there, there's lots of questions, uh, Harshad, but uh, I just wanted to, you know, just getting us started, we, we don't have uh, time really, but wanted to understand uh, how do you, uh, you've been with uh, mid-cap investing for 14 years so how did you come to mid-cap investing? It's just uh, serendipity or it's something that you sought, actively sought? 
Uh, sorry, uh, I am not sure I understood your question. Can you rephrase, please? So, 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 is mid cap investing after moving from the sell side to the buy side? Is mid cap investing something that you actively sought, that you wanted to be a mid cap person, or how how do you go about being a mid cap investor? Okay, no, no, I do manage uh, other mandates also. So we okay. have multi cap fund. We have, but mid cap, frankly, is uh, is mid cap investing is fascinating. Uh, because first twelve years of my career, I I spent on sell side, researching stocks myself, uh, understanding sectors, etc. And right. uh, as I as I explained with those charts, that mid cap and small caps are basically parts of the uh, continuum which is less research. So the, right. so the you know personally speaking, the high you get by identifying a particular uh, you know business early on, then not many people are looking at it. Uh, I think that is nothing beats that, right? So uh, right. I would say that I enjoy mid cap investing uh, much more uh, than large cap investing. Although uh, from a job perspective, I do both. Uh, right. And and the other important thing is uh, it also tests you better because mid cap investing. I didn't mention that uh, during the course of the but thanks for you know asking this question because uh, it's important to remember uh, if you are investing in mid caps yourself or in mid cap funds, uh, volatility and corrections is part of the game. Right? right, you will generally notice that the uh, volatility tends to be on the higher side in mid caps and small caps. Right, uh, right? so that is the time that actually tests you. Uh, right. That uh, you know, should you buckle under pressure and uh, take some action, or uh, you know, uh, many times the the corrections that happen in the mid cap small caps that allows you to buy stocks that you always wanted to buy at, right. at cheaper valuations. So I think that is a more exciting part. Of investing, right. in my opinion. So, so uh, uh, Harshad, you touched upon portfolio construction a little bit when you mentioned at the design stage itself, you factor in liquidity. Can you spend uh, just a minute on how do you get ideas? How do you get your ideas? How should people get their ideas on mid cap investing? You obviously you've got many more portfolios under your belt, but uh, the idea formation and the portfolio construction, if you can explain in one minute, I'm sorry, it's a tall order, but if you can please okay so see idea generation happens can uh, or you can get ideas from various sources right firstly uh, um, you know one big thing that we keep doing or spend considerable time is uh, uh, attending uh, investor conferences listening to managements talking about their businesses and so on so you can get ideas from there you can also get ideas from sell side research uh, uh, right so ideas can come from, and, and of course, uh, as a matter of your job, you are reading a lot. You are reading balance sheets, you are reading sector reports from that. So the ideas can come from anywhere. Uh, what is more important is to, you know, 80, 90% of the ideas you, uh, you end up discarding. So in our research process, if you see, it's, it's like a funnel. So there are many ideas that come from various sources, but post that, uh, you have to basically uh, think a lot about the business economics, you have to think a lot about how you know how does this business make money. You have to look at the management track record. You have to look at the promoters. Are there any other companies that might adversely impact this particular uh, business? Uh, and you have to look at the financials. And finally, you have to look at the valuations. So uh, it is like a funnel approach that uh, we uh, you know if you look at statistically, we uh, end up probably buying five to ten stocks from the hundred stocks that we would look at. So a lot of uh, you know what not to buy uh, is also as important as what to buy. Uh, as far as portfolio construction is concerned, uh, very briefly, uh, as I as I mentioned, that uh, primarily we get our ideas from a bottom up perspective, right? So we we do that, but there is also a layer uh, where you have to think about sectors and factors and ask yourself: Am I taking inadvertent negative bets on any of the sectors or factors? And uh, so that question is very, very important if you are, particularly if you are managing, uh, you know, uh, a, a mandate, managing money for other people. Uh, if you are investing on your own, that factor may not be very relevant for you. But if you are building a portfolio for your investors, I think uh, risk mitigation, looking at the negative bets also is very important. Right. Uh, Sagar and this uh, two, B, two, of, two of our uh, attendees, Sagar and Isheng, they're asking about corporate governance. Uh, so how do you regard corporate governance? Is there a checklist that people can look at, uh, you know, for uh, for mid cap and small cap stocks? 
Yes, so corporate governance, of course, is a very important aspect uh, that goes into evaluating, uh, you know, business management and so on. So we spend a lot of time and what helps is that, uh, you know, uh, because uh, now I've had almost three decades of experience, you remember uh, promoters, uh, you know, what happened to them 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Many times uh, the same promoters can come back in a different altar and you, you still remember what had happened last time round. Right. So that helps. But yes, corporate governance is very important from the perspective of how they treat the minority shareholders. Uh, I will just give one example because it's a very vast subject and we can you know, spend half an hour discussing that. I will just mention in 2018, uh, uh, you know, recently when the market corrected, one other factor became very, very important. And we sort of consciously incorporated that in our investment process now was the issue of promoter pledge. Uh, because in 2018, what happened is when the market was correcting, uh, businesses which had lots of promoter pledge, they were forced to sell. So therefore, when, when we look at the business and management, we separately looked at, look at the promoters. Because this particular company from a promoter group may be doing very, very well. But there may be another company in the same promoter group which may be stressed. And promoter may need to fund, uh, you know, create funds for that company using this particular company. Uh, so that is just one example, but corporate governance is, is, a, is a very important issue and that goes in one of the screeners that we have. The funnel that I mentioned, corporate governance is a very important issue, yes. One of the other questions, uh, you know, uh, there are there's two, two folks asking this question, how do you spot the bottom of the cycle? Sandhya is also asking, is timing important in mid cap? And we know as, you know, uh, CFA charter holders that timing is nothing in investing. But what are your thoughts uh, in terms of cycles? Uh, are there any such cycles or is that another myth? Oh, no, no. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, frankly, uh, Srinivas, my view in, in this particular aspect has evolved over a period of time after having looked at various cycles. So I will just give, uh, you know, uh, explain with an example. Any stock that we buy for the portfolio, we classify into four buckets. Let me not talk about all four. Let me talk about just two uh, uh, addressing this question. The first bucket we call strategy. These are typically businesses which are a typical compounding story, right? So if you look at private sector banks, let's say 10, 15, 20 years ago, that they have kept on generating 20, you know, in the initial periods, 30%, then 25%, now 20% return year after year after year. Similarly, many consumer companies, paint companies have kept on compounding at a, so these are strategic businesses or loosely speaking in, in uh, uh, you can say that these are typically buy and hold kind of businesses that if uh, only if there is a strong reason to exit, you need to exit. But there are also businesses which are cyclical in nature, which are more levered to the economic growth. So I will give an example. I can't talk about stock, but I will give an example. If you look at construction related businesses, right? These are cyclical businesses. If you look at the return on equity of those businesses over the last 10, 15, 20 years, you know, you will definitely conclude that these are cyclical businesses that the bottom of the cycle, they may not be beating cost of equity, but in, in good times, they will do, do well. So cyclical, so the other bucket that we have is are cyclical businesses. So we do buy some of them at the right stage of the cycle. The critical thing is you can, you know, you can never uh, exactly buy anything at the bottom and sell anything exactly at the top, but broadly from an economic cycle perspective or the sector cycle perspective, if you can buy some of these stocks uh, at the bottom of the cycle trending up, uh, you know, you may not hold them for 10 years, but in two, three, four years, they can generate good returns for the portfolio. So we do that too. Curious uh, to know what are the two other buckets? The other two buckets are, one is defensive, uh, which is not, not from the perspective of consumer and pharma, which many people associate with defensive. Defensive from the perspective of the negative bets that I was talking about. So if you have a sector which has, let's say, 15% uh, weight in the benchmark, right? But you are not very confident. You are, you are not very positive. The question to ask is, am I so confident that I, I, you know, I am prepared to own 0% when the benchmark is 15%? So sometimes you reluctantly, particularly if this is more relevant, Srinivas, for relative return mandates, where you are judged against the benchmark. So these are defensive uh, bets that you reluctantly buy from a negative bets perspective. And the fourth one is options. As the name suggests, uh, I mean, we, we don't buy options as in the futures and options, but options are, are the category where you may not have a lo long track record for that business, right? 
an example being, let's say, uh, because it is uh, in fashion these days, I will give an example. So if there was a business available to play electric vehicles in India, right? From a top-down perspective, that will be a very compelling opportunity. But clearly, there is no long track record. So these are the businesses that we sometimes buy uh, in, in small quantity uh, because the, the, op, the payoff from the option can be zero or one. Either you will end up making a lot of money or that will go to zero. So that's the fourth category. It's fascinating because, you know, Peter Lynch, I'm sure you would have known, uh, you know, he has got a similar categorization when he used to do his uh, stock picking. There are many more questions. So uh, I'm, I, I don't know if it is possible to spend only 30 seconds so that we can uh, per question. So let me go quickly uh, and highlight to me that it's not possible. Uh, uh, feel free to, you know, take more time as well. Tarl is asking, are the mid cap index returns good to, due to survivorship bias? Any studies on or insights on churn in the mid cap index? We know that there's a lot of churn in the Sensex. 50% uh, over a decade, is that right? So what's the equivalent number for mid caps? Uh, any quick thoughts? Uh, so frankly, uh, survivorship bias is definitely there, but that's there in all indices, uh, large cap index as well as uh, mid cap index. Uh, so it is possible that it is you know more there in mid cap index, absolutely possible. But if you look at, and therefore, if you look at, don't forget about indices. If you look at a good quality large cap uh, fund, and a good quality mid cap fund and compare last 15 years of track record, you will realize that uh, mid cap funds have done far better. Right. What is, uh, this is an anonymous person, but I also had this question, uh, Harshad. So what is one of the biggest mistake that all of us can learn from, uh, you know, uh, which you, you, you are able to share without taking any name of a, any particular company? Sure. So frankly, I've made so many mistakes that I will need several pages to list them down. But let me talk about just one, which is very relevant in India, by the way. And I learned it and this particular mistake I committed uh, uh, in 2015, uh, you know, when uh, uh, the current prime minister uh, came in first uh, in 2014, mid 2014, there was a lot of euphoria. And uh, it appeared that he will come and you know magically change things uh, across sectors and so on. Uh, I also fell victim uh, to, to, to that particular uh, mistake. So one big learning, one big mistake we made, and therefore one big learning for which I would like to share with uh, everybody is that the government announcements at the top level that they are going to do this, going to do that, may not immediately translate into a stock idea that you can buy because the timelines from government announcement, even though the intentions may be great by the government, for it to translate to a, a winning stock, it may take several quarters, if not several years. So, uh, you know, what I will, uh, you know, uh, caution people against is that just because government announces, you know, these days the markets are such that a government uh, or, or even a secretary of government announcing something, though relevant stocks go up 10, 15%, just like that. So uh, I think we should uh, guard against that euphoria that for any government action to translate into a winning stock, it takes several quarters or even sometimes several years. Yep, I mean, most of the, the big investors, right, they've said that, you know, the holding period of any stock is forever. Uh, but as a, as a CIO and also as a fund manager, uh, you, you have got your compulsions in terms of, uh, you know, retail holdings and regulatory rules. So how do you see that? What's your favorite holding period? Uh, what does it translate to in the mid cap space? Is there a, uh, to make it short, is there a heuristic people can use? So uh, as I mentioned, Srinivas, uh, that you, you know, we categorize stocks in buckets. In the strategic bucket, I would say that even my philosophy will be uh, forever. So there are some stocks which we have bought in our portfolio uh, 14 years ago, and, and they are still there the bets would have changed. I think because we are active fund managers, it's very important to remember that there are times when I may need to change the bet because I'm looking at it from the perspective of, and this is very different from an individual investor who may buy and forget, right? For him, things are different because, you know, we are active fund managers. There are times when we want to, it, it happens many times, just as an example, that we may buy a particular stock with an expected return of 30% over the next 12 months based on you know uh, our uh, hypothesis of earnings projection uh, earnings progression and valuation related 
in markets like these, the stock may be up 25% in a week, right? So we have to think from a portfolio perspective. So always we are thinking uh, from an operating perspective on a one year forward basis. Uh, if that stock, which, were, which we expected will go up 30% in a year is up 25% in a, in a week or a fortnight, we do not hesitate taking some money off the table and invest it somewhere else where the stock would have fallen without any changes because the expected return from there are higher. Now, this, this may be very peculiar to uh, fund management. It may not be relevant for individual investors, but you have to do it. Uh, but for our strategic bucket, the philosophy is that they are there forever. We don't want to exit unless something bad. However, for cyclical businesses, uh, uh, you, know, you have to buy them at the right stage of the cycle and sell them at the right stage of the cycle. Just holding on to them uh, because you want to hold them forever, that will actually not be good for your investors. So you have to look at a context uh, as to you know, why you have bought a particular stock and then decide. If you look at uh, you know, average holding period, for our strategy, which by the way, which includes strategic, tactical, defensive, all. So on an average, we have held a stock uh, at least for three years. But if you look at the strategic uh, stocks, you know, there are many stocks which have, we have never sold over the last 40 years. So if you can spend just a minute or so on uh, risk, right? The, the risk management tools that are being in, in use, like what are the practical tools you're using? Are you looking at portfolio parameters like Know, price to earning ratios or betas uh, how do you how do you manage this so what are the conceptual framework and what are the practical tools okay so uh, you know obviously when we do research itself as i said like a funnel uh, that is the time when we also obviously look at various risks which is why as i said that typically of the 100 companies that uh, you know we would study we will end up buying only five or ten of them because when we are looking at a business one of the most fundamental things uh, in, in growth investing, I think, is the reinvestment opportunity, right? Uh, so that is uh, very critical. Uh, but apart from that, when you are looking at management, when you are looking at the management track record, when you are looking at the promoter group, there are many risks that you are uh, looking at. Uh, you know, you, you may not be able to quantify those risks, but, you know, obviously you are trying to eliminate many of these risks and therefore eliminate many of the ideas. Uh, from a risk perspective, uh, I did mention that one of the very important risks from a relative return uh, uh, fund management perspective is uh, how are you placed vis-a-vis -vis the benchmark. And therefore, negative bets, I, I did highlight a couple of times that negative bets is something, it's an important risk mitigation uh, perspective. And of course, you are looking at liquidity risk. I did spend the whole slide on liquidity risk is very, very important. And the way we look at liquidity is not, a, it's not static, right? In a year like 2018, 20, beginning of 2018, before the market crashed, the number of average shares traded in a particular stock were very different uh, from the number at the end of 2018 when the market collapsed. So you have to look at that particular risk in a very dynamic fashion. So what we do is we take average three month uh, daily average, uh, we assume a participation rate of 20%, 30% and see how many days it will take us to exit that particular position. That's very dynamic. So liquidity risk, risk of negative bets, uh, and of course, risk associated with the business management promoters are some of the risks that you have to be very mindful of. And you cannot really look at those risks uh, before you buy the stock. You have to continue to monitor them all along. So is drawdown a bit of a pain? I mean, uh, Venkata Chalam has asked this question. Uh, and you know there are drawdowns. And as retail investors, not just in India, everywhere in the world, you know people, uh, you know, uh, sell uh, sell low and buy high. So what are your thoughts, very quick thoughts on that? I think it's a very important question and I'm glad uh, that you took up this question. As I mentioned, in mid-cap investing, uh, volatility and corrections is a part of the game. You cannot really run away from that at all. Uh, volatility is, is bound to be there. Uh, and therefore, you're right that uh, many investors actually uh, behave in a very irrational fashion. Uh, what we do is that because our mandate, our strategy is open-ended strategy, we do not tend to take cash calls. So, uh, you know, you, you will not find us having 10% cash in the portfolio because our philosophy is that the asset allocation is done by the investor along with his financial advisor. And then he gives us money to invest in mid-cap area. My job is to do that in the best possible way. So we never really take cash calls. 
we also do not deviate from the mandate and tend to own large cap stocks in the portfolio because that's not why the uh, investor has given me the money my job is to invest in the best possible way in the quality businesses uh, if you recall when i talked about uh, the three myths what we tend to do is we want to invest in leading companies in smaller product market segments so when a correction in the market happens it's inevitable that our uh, our nav will also come down however because we have done our uh, due diligence and we you know we have we have underlying businesses which are of quality in terms of business management uh, typically there is no permanent diminution in value i think in mid cap and small cap investing what people should be very uh, cautious of is the permanent diminution in value in a market that we have witnessed over the last 18 20 months when everything has gone up you know all kind of stocks have gone up small cap and mid caps so what i would i would uh, submit is that you cannot really run away from drawdown or volatility if you are investing in mid cap and small caps it is part of the game but so long as you own quality businesses uh, that you are confident of uh, you know the typically the the drawdown is temporary uh, fundamentals do reassert themselves from a medium to long term perspective and this is exactly what we have seen over the last 14 15 years jay is asking uh, you know what is the career advice you must be getting a lot of resumes from people uh, are you hiring first of all what is the career advice for uh, for many youngsters who want to uh, enter uh, as analysts as fund managers okay so uh, you know my advice particularly to youngsters is not to take a shortcut um, to uh, if you really want to make a career uh, in uh, in investing it's very very important there are two aspects broadly speaking two uh, sub processes in investing one is research the other is portfolio management so people who are you know young and just about starting i would uh, uh, you know request them to spend as much time in research as possible focus on understanding the business uh, understanding uh, uh, sectors so you you know you can start with a relatively simple sector uh you know which is let's say paint as a sector which is relatively simple with only a handful of companies really try to understand the sector by looking at uh, annual reports and not just read latest annual report you know uh, if you have the time and inclination uh, read last 5 10 15 years of annual reports so that the picture emerges and then you can connect the dots so spend as much time as possible in reading stuff particularly annual reports you know these days it's not fashionable to read annual reports there is so much uh, so much of stuff to read but if particularly for youngsters i think reading annual reports you know starting from the basics uh, fundamentals is very very important uh, in my view and that will uh, basically help you understand the sectors and then you will in, you will start making a mental picture as to how is paint sector for example is related to housing how is paint sector related to automobile and so on so that's the you know the hard way but please don't uh, fall for taking a shortcut particularly if you are just starting you are from iit bombay so are you using any machine learning any of the latest uh, uh, technological advances uh, that are there in data science and asset management in particular uh, in your in your tool set uh, not at the moment but that's an area which is very very exciting and i'm trying trying to learn uh, on that but at the moment we are not not using that one last question there are actually two last questions if uh, if you permit uh, you must be getting lots of resumes uh, what is the one thing that you want people to do in the resumes and what is the one thing that you really dislike in the resumes uh, <laughs> uh, i mean that has to do with you know more i would say uh, personality rather than uh, is that uh, uh, you know i think uh, somebody who is trying to show show off um uh, it 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 puts tends to put me off so uh, but that's uh, i think the most important thing i would look for uh, in a resume is and resume is not enough in in discussion is the uh, willingness to learn i think the hunger for learning uh, particularly you know uh, the youngsters that is probably the most important thing uh, the focus should be on uh, can i understand this better rather than can i make more money because that will inevitably come if you understand stuff better if you can form a mental picture of what's happening uh, you will be able to take good judgment calls and and make money so the focus should be in my opinion on 
learning hunger for learning is absolutely important particularly in the beginning of the career so harshad now uh, you know you've accomplished uh, fund manager cio what next uh, do you plan to be the next warren buffett the peter lynch uh, are you going to uh, planning to write a book what are your thoughts oh no 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 i mean you uh, don't embarrass me by taking names of the greats in the industry you know they are of course uh, something that you look up to but uh, you know i don't think uh, you know it's possible to match what what they have created one always strives uh, what i you know i am not really planning on a book but what i do uh, from time to time is that i do uh, write uh, articles on important issues which i think are critical for the distribution community uh, and for the investors in general so for example the liquidity issue that i talked about the last slide i did write uh, a small two pager because nobody really has the time to read a lot of stuff and I, we distributed it uh, to our distribution partners uh, and through them to our investors because there are many you know as i said there are many myths that we discussed in the beginning in mid cap uh, investing even today uh, and there are many issues which are extremely relevant uh, like liquidity which unfortunately becomes important only in bad times but it's very important is our fiduciary responsibility to highlight that risk when times are good uh so what i do is i do write on some of these concepts from time to time but uh, you know i will take that as a suggestion and you know hopefully in the future think up uh, about a book also where where should people be looking for your write ups is it on your linkedin page or is yes, it on so typically i typically uh, you know put it on on linkedin they are also available on some of them are available even on edelweiss website who is your favorite investor and what book should people read so uh, you know i i think there is there are things to learn from different investors so i don't think i don't won't pick uh, uh, any single one but i think from all the accomplished investors there is always something uh, that you can learn it's very important uh, ultimately to understand what kind of a person you are uh, what is your personality what is your temperament so not everything will suit you but uh, i think it is equally important uh, now that you have asked this question uh, to also know yourself uh, better as to what suits you because there are different ways of generating returns in the market right we we see uh, people with very different personalities very different styles equally successful so ultimately the the bottom line is you have to identify what kind of a person you are what kind what is your temperament what suits you more uh, and just follow that path if you try to do something which is very contrary to your personality and temperament uh, i don't think that will be helpful at all any any recommendations for books for people to read of uh, nothing really frank, frankly all the investment books that uh, you know everybody uh, um, would have read uh, in my opinion i think one should try to read not just investment books but all sorts of uh, books uh, so recently i wrote a book a uh, read a book uh, written by our ex foreign secretary uh, vijay gokhale on uh, tiananmen square incident Uh, which was fascinating uh, he takes you uh, back to those periods which frankly we know only through the media he was there on the ground so right. i i like reading books uh, from you know across not just investing investment books uh, because right. that actually expands your horizon and again as i said uh, helps you connect the dots absolutely uh, you, can, you can you can use that the the learnings from that to try to understand what's happening in china today for example there are big things happening in china this book helps you understand uh, gives you some perspective no this has been a fascinating talk harshad i'm sure you know our listeners would have enjoyed this a lot it's going to be listened to once it goes on youtube as, as well uh, i hope you liked it thank you so very much for spending time with us today and you know creating the presentation uh, and uh, coming and talking in front of us thank you very much thanks shrinivas thank you very much thanks again to cfa institute india and everybody who attended the presentation i really enjoyed the interaction thank you bye thank you very much thank you all see you on the next webinar which is on career side insights harshad has already posted it uh, on the chat thank you again thank you harshad